Elevating and Engaging Black Judges. My name is Zanelle October. I'm the Executive Vice President at the American Constitution Society. I'm excited to welcome you to part three of this important series. Before we dive into today's program, I do want to pause for a moment given current events to stress that ACS stands in solidarity with our Asian American and Pacific Islander friends and family. The surge in violence against AAPI individuals is abhorrent and unacceptable. Such violence and discrimination underscore the threat that this that is white supremacy and the urgency in prioritizing anti-racism in this country. Thank you for listening. For those new to our organization, the American Constitution Society is the country's foremost progressive legal organization with more than 200 student and lawyer chapters across the nation. ACS is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year of shaping national debates, nurturing the next generation of lawyers, judges, and advocates, and ensuring the law is a force to improve the lives of all people. We are dedicating this anniversary year to race and the Constitution and to reckoning with the past for a much more just future. If you don't already, we encourage you to follow ACS on social media, including on Twitter at ACS Law. You can also find us online at acslaw.org. There you can join ACS and find more information about upcoming events and opportunities. For example, our next program is on March 30th, titled Founding Failures, the Consequences of the Constitution's Original Sin for a Criminal Legal System. I'd like to thank our co-hosts for putting together this much needed program. The B National Black Law Students Association, the National Bar Association, and of course, Professor Michelle Goodwin. Michelle has worked tirelessly to bring this series together. Thank you also to these incredible judges for taking the time tonight to share with us their perspectives, stories, and wisdom. Tonight's program is about the importance of diversity in the judiciary and the need specifically for more black judges. By elevating the experiences of our incredible speakers, we also hope this conversation inspires our students and lawyers on the call to see themselves as future judges. We must diversify the bench so that judges better reflect the communities they serve. Right now, federal judges are overwhelmingly white and male. For Article III judges, approximately 74% of those judges are white. Only 12% are black. Men make up 67%, while women make up approximately 33%. This lack of diversity is particularly glaring on the Seventh Circuit, where 100% of active judges are white, and the Tenth Circuit, which is 90% white and has only one black judge. There are a number of district courts where nominating a woman or a woman of color would be a first for those courts. And yes, in 2021. You can find detailed information about a similar lack of diversity in our state courts on our website. We're including a link in the chat to a report ACS released in 2015 on this exact topic. In sum, the Biden-Harris administration and the Senate majority have an abundance of opportunities to hit the ground running on nominating new judges who better reflect the communities they serve. And ACS is playing a leading role in assembling a pool of potential judges, judicial nominees for the Biden-Harris administration to consider. We're doing that through our 50 working groups across 37 states and hope you, you join us and, and follow the work that we're doing. We've been featured in lots of news lately um, for our work in turning over 400 names to the Biden-Harris transition team. And we're also working on a year-round program to prepare students and young lawyers, especially BIPOC and first-generation students for clerkships as we consider the path to the bench. We hosted a program with judges last month and we'll host another program with former clerks next week at the ACS Virtual Student Convention, March 25th to 27th. See the link in the chat box to learn more and to register. Thank you all for attending this event and I look forward to seeing you at future events. I'll now, now pass the mic to C.K. Hoffler, the CEO of the C.K. Hoffler Firm and president of the National Bar Association. Well, thank you so much, um, Ms. October and, and to, um, ACS, thank you so much for putting this together. Um, this is just an incredible panel, a needed panel, a very important discussion. I also want to thank Professor Goodwin for her tireless efforts in, in this series. This is the third of a series, as they've indicated. It gives me great delight on behalf of the National Bar Association to discuss something that is near and dear to my heart. I would dare say for anyone who knows me, I've been a lawyer for 34 years, they would know one thing that I believe that judges are absolutely 
at the top of our profession. They are, as the French say, the creme de la creme. They really are. Their, their service to this country, their service to our communities is unparalleled. And I say that on behalf of the National Bar because we believe that we have the best and the brightest. And for those of you all who are not yet members of the National Bar Judicial Council section, we are encouraging you to join this panel that we have today of these phenomenal, dedicated servant leaders and judges. Really, just it just warms my heart to be on a panel with them because we must elevate and, and we must support our African-American judges and we must support diversity on the bench. Just like ACS, the National Bar Association has submitted many, many, many names because we believe in diversification of the bench. That's how we really make a stronger democracy and a stronger America. And so it is a priority for us. We have um, been engaged in very meaningful discussions with the Biden-Harris administration on a weekly basis because we are determined to diversify the bench. The statistics are completely unacceptable. I mean, that's how I think we have to look at it. We have to refuse to be denied. We have to continue to push collectively until we see a change on the bench, because that's the only way that we will move forward as a country and reflect the people in this country. We also stand in solidarity um, with our friends and our colleagues, our AAPI colleagues and friends, and we denounce absolutely the hate crimes that are happening. I'm in Atlanta. I'm in Atlanta. Last night when I turned on the news, I saw that three people had been killed at a spa, um, at two spas this morning, eight people were killed. These acts of terrorism, these acts of violence, just as we saw the acts of violence in the failed coup d'etat on January 6th of 2021 must stop. They must stop. Just as we have seen, and we, if you're in the African-American community, we have lived and breathed the George Floyd, Breonna Taylor examples, but just as mainstream America and the world watched with horror, the killing of George Floyd, and it, it, it prompted a reaction from people globally. Um, and while it is commonplace in our community, we also condemn that type of violence, racism, targeting, and oppression. And so we welcome this discussion with this wonderful panel and I thank you for including us. I'm not sure who I'm supposed to now introduce, but I will just say that I wanted to also applaud our extraordinary chair of the National Bar Association Judicial Council, Judge Sanria Edwards, and to someone who is a trailblazer, who every single judge tries to emulate, and that is Judge Bernice Donald. Um, just, we thank you so much for what you've done. U.S. Court of Appeals, Sixth Circuit. Um, your example that you have given, not just to members of the judiciary, but to people like me, um, it's just so deeply appreciated. So thank you so much. I say to Judge Whitner, who I don't know well, to Judge Hazel, who I don't know well, and to young Rachel Barnes, my goodness, she's the future. I say yeah. to all of you, thank you so much and um, in advance, and I know this is gonna be a great dialogue. Thank you so much, President Hoffler. Rachel. Thank you, Professor Goodwin, and thank you guys all for including the National Law Students Association in this discussion. This year, our theme was defining our future and what better way to amplify that by talking about the importance of diversifying the judiciary. So we are very grateful to be here. And again, like the National Bar Association, Nabolsa also denounces the hate crimes against the Asian community, Asian American and Pacific Islander community because it's unacceptable. And as, as we've continued to state, this is not the violence we wanna see in our world. We wanna see peace, co collaboration and community. And so hopefully through this discussion, we can foster some of that and raise greater awareness. So with that, I'm very excited to do a brief introduction of the individuals we have on this panel today, starting with the Honorable Judge Bernice Donald of the US Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. Then we have the Honorable Judge Senria Edwards of Kings County Civil Court, Second District, as well as the Chair of the National Bar Association's Judicial Council. Thank you for your service. <laughs> Next, we have the Honorable Judge George J. Hazel of the U.S. District Court for the District of Maryland. And of course, the Honorable Justice 
Helen Whitener of Washington State Supreme Court. But of course, this panel is being moderated by the, the tireless warrior for justice and equity, Professor Michelle Goodwin, Chancellor's Professor of Law and Director of the Center for Biotechnology and Global Health Policy at the University of California, Irvine. I'll pass it back to you. Thank you so much, Rachel. It has been a pleasure being on this journey with you. I ask that you stay on because uh, I'd like for those who are tuning in with us to lift up their questions, to put them in the Q&A uh, or the chat. And I'm going to ask that Rachel help me out with that as we get towards that part in our program with lifting those up. Uh, but we're gonna start off with a conversation and, and thank you so much. And the conversation that I'd like to start with actually centers on what President Hoffler has shared with us being in Atlanta, turning on the news last night, seeing the horror. We know in communities of color um, that the attacks on homes, places of worship, businesses, schools are not new. This, these are experiences that have been part of our very legacy, the earliest experiences in this nation and coming out of the bondages of slavery in Jim Crow, quite common violence against black communities and also other communities of color, including Asian American communities. So I actually wanna start off with um, a question that I hadn't planned for when we were originally um, planning this. And that is, a question that relates to your safety and your security. We will get there in terms of talking about your pathway, but I wanna ask you, do you worry about your safety as you um, engage in the law, as you dispense justice? Are those things that you've had to worry about in your career? And I'd like to start with you first, Judge Whitener. no more than I have as a black woman. I am safe actually, more safe when I have the robe on than I feel when I take it off because the respect and the decorum that is given to me in the robe, once I take it off, no one knows that I'm a judge or a justice. And my safety is as any other black individual in America. So, I think it depends on where I'm at and what role I'm playing where I would um, assess my safety. So for me, I'm safest in the robe, on the bench, doing my job than I am when I take it off and venture out into the world. That's powerful. You know, what message does that send? And it makes me think about turning to you, Judge Hazel, then. Uh, what does that mean for you as you navigate the world? And, and Judge, Justice Weiner, I'm glad that you mentioned that because often people will ignore the violence against black women and the insecurity that black women experience, um, thinking of it as, as exclusively uh, about black men, but it's not exclusively. And we learned that through Breonna Taylor, but so much, so many other women beyond Breonna Taylor. Uh, judge Hazel, what about you? So in my role as a judge, you know, there was a case couple of years ago that uh, was, was somewhat high profile and gathered attention, uh, including from uh, individuals who were not particularly pleased with my ruling. It was, it was a ruling, it was in the census case uh, that, that I handled a couple of years ago. Um, and after that ruling, we did as a chambers receive some Concerning phone calls, you know, you're you're a traitor, and um, you know other other comments along those lines that I won't repeat here in in good company. Um, and you know, I, I think that if you are in this kind of role on some level, you have to understand that that's sort of what comes with it. That if you find yourself in a position where you gain or garner attention for a decision that on whichever way you rule that there could be, if it's a hot button issue, some of that feedback. I have a lot of faith in our marshal service. Um, if, if I so much as, uh, you know, intimate, suggest, infer 
that I am uncomfortable about any situation or any phone call that I have received. Uh, they are swift to meet with me, talk with me, uh, let me know how they can help me feel more safe, help me know uh, what I should be able to do, who I call if I feel uncomfortable, if I feel something is, uh, is going on. Um, and so, I, you know, it, it's, they, they do as good of a job as they can. There's, mm. you know, there are people in the world who uh, wish other people harm and you cannot protect yourself 100% against that. But, um, but I, I do feel like the marshal service do the best they can in that. So, but you're also saying that it is a concern that you've had to experience as a judge. And so that's very interesting too. It's two different perspectives, right? Take off the robe and, uh, and what that means being in our nation as a black woman. And then what it means even when you have your robe on. And, and I'd like to pose that same question about your safety and security, how you navigate um, Judge Edwards and, and then Judge Donald. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for posing that question. I think it's a question that um, Black judges in particular often face, and not so much for me for the physical aspect, but it comes with the respect that's given mentally with the robe when you have the robe on, and they recognize that you are a judge, and not everyone, as opposed to when you don't have the robe on, how you're treated. I have not had any physical threats. I live in a community where I serve, so that has never been a problem, but it is a problem when they have access to your information. For example, with Judge Esther Salas. So I think they really need to deal with technology and how we are so easily accessible it's for future uh, references. But no, I have not had physical threats, more mental uh, sort of thing. And, and you mentioned Judge Esther Salas, and it was a year ago that her 20-year-old son, Daniel, was fatally shot um, and killed, and her husband was injured and shot uh, when a lawyer um, and a self-described anti-feminist, uh, Royden Hollander, uh, posed as a delivery person and opened fire at her home. Um, he was later found dead via suicide, but, but these are real issues um, for, our, for our judges. And that was just a year ago. And, and so Judge Donald, what about you? Have those been concerns for you? Or is it that, you know, when you take off your robe, that's re really when you have to worry um, as a black woman? Well, thank you, Professor Goodwin. And let me just thank uh, ACS and all of those who sponsored this program for the opportunity to participate. Uh, let me just say that I am currently in my fourth um, judicial position. So I'm gonna start and say that early on in my career as a limited jurisdiction criminal court judge, I actually uh, was very visible as Judge Hazel mentioned. Um, I was, while I was in a limited jurisdiction court, I was in a high profile position because I was the first African-American woman in the history of the state to serve as a judge. And there were situations where people became angry for different reasons. Uh, and so there was a time when uh, I actually had to have around the clock protection from the sheriff's department because of threats against me in that position. Um, the bankruptcy court was uh, not a court where people seemed to get agitated and irritated. But I, on the district court and, and now on the appellate court, um, there is, um, I, I guess, a different um, type of, of threat. Uh, people identify with causes and uh, oftentimes in media reporting, judges are identified to a certain political party. There may be a certain type of case that is emotionally charged and information uh, I have learned is oftentimes circulated on the internet, which really foments anger against judges. And there are um, dialogues going on that oftentimes are filled with misinformation that really can get people agitated and create a real and present threat uh, mm -hmm. against judges. You know, fortunately, we as federal judges are encouraged 
not to have much of a presence on social media or to have no presence really. But that doesn't mean that even if you don't physically have a presence that, they're, that you're not on the, the internet because of other people's interest, their targeting and their conversations. And I think that's where the threat comes from. And the reason it makes it so dangerous is because you may or may not know that that is even going on. And then when you add in the whole dilemma of the deep fakes, when yeah. people are interested in mounting um, a, a campaign, a targeted campaign against the judge, the judge may be totally unaware. Now, hopefully there are security interests out there who are monitoring things like that and can bring it to the judge's attention and, and put in place uh, mechanisms to further protect judges. But that, that I see from where I am now is, uh, is the greatest source of danger. And I will add this, uh, because on the appellate court, people don't see me and because there are so many TV judges now, Many people in my community, when uh, they see me at the airport or something, they assume that I'm retired because I've gone away to the appellate court and, and, and normally most cases that are reported on are not identified to a particular judge. So I'm basically sort of uh, in, the, in the shadows now for most people, but on the, for the online presence, it is very real as people monitor the outputs of courts and the, what they perceive to be the ideology of judges. Well, it's, it's interesting that you should say that because with the internet uh, providing such great access to everybody and that also combined with a kind of stoking of fears, one might say, um, in recent years, as you were mentioning, connecting judges to certain opinions, identifying them by their uh, ethnicity or racial background to suggest that somehow they could be biased. I mean, it reminds me of what Chief Justice John Roberts um, was compelled to have to say that there is no such thing as Obama judges, Bush judges, Trump judges, et cetera, because of the kind of rhetoric uh, that was in the air and that was uh, flying around. And so what I'd like to do then is to touch on something that then level sets again for our audience, because we have a mixed audience. We have students, uh, we have professors, we have law clerks, and many of them are interested in your journeys. How did you get to where you are? And did you think that it was ever going to be possible? I mean, when you were in, when you were in law school or as undergraduates, were you thinking a judge? That's where I'm going. That's where I'm headed. That's what I'm going to do. And so if I may, I'd like to start with you, Judge Edwards, in answering that question. Was that something that was on your mind? Uh, to the law students, um, it was nowhere near my mind. I am also a CPA. So when I went to law school, I just already knew that I was coming out and I was going into tax because tax was my background. And that's exactly what I did. My uh, early career is international taxation of international and domestic banks and mergers and acquisitions. So I had a niche. I went into law school with a niche as a CPA. But when I came out of corporate America, I wanted to serve one of the branches of government. So I thought I was gonna go into the legislative branch. So I actually ran for public office before. And when I ran, after running, and I lost to a very, very strong, 25 year incumbent, but I was the only person who had ever gotten double digits against this uh, incumbent. So I said, I don't think I want to be a legislator. My campaign was so tough that my uh, opponent's camp came back and said that you need to be a judge. <laughs> and I thought about it and I always wanted to be a public service. I was a litigator in court and I said it was time for my career to propel to the other side, to make it whole. And that's what I, I did. So for all you young people, it may not be in your plan today, but make sure that as you're growing in your career, I mean, to become a judge, it's just so many things that you have to keep in place and in order. So keep your life in order. Uh, stay out of trouble in the ethics commissions. That's very, very important. And keep your name good because you don't know today where you will end up. You could not have told me that I was not going to be a tax guru for all of my life. 
So Justice Weiner, I'm, I'm curious about what your path was. You know, what were you thinking when you were an undergraduate in law school? Was the path going to be uh, a judge or was it going to be like Judge Edwards said, <laughs> something entirely different? She's doing international tax. And my background was international marketing. I'm original <laughs> from the island of Trinidad and Tobago. Did you two know that? About no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I was I know that. To hear that. Um, but I was born and raised on a Caribbean island. And I came here at 16, disabled on my right side. And um, once I was able to rehabilitate, started on the graduate degree, completed that, worked in international marketing, ended up in Alaska and was returning back to Trinidad because it was just too cold up there <laughs> when a friend said, you know, you should try Washington State. And I did. Couldn't get a job in my field. So I ended up doing accounts receivables. So I guess close enough to the accounting. Yes. And while there, one of the partners of that accounting firm was also a lawyer and he suggested law school. So I go to law school, I graduate. My path is that of an immigrant. I've held down three jobs always, you know, prosecutor, defense, um, you name it, I've done it. Uh, ALJ judge, administrative appeals judge. But the thing is, I was a public defender in a courtroom with a judge and he approached me one day and asked if I had ever considered being a pro tem judge. Now the system I came from was the British system. So I have no context, no concept of the American judicial system. I'm working through law school and learning as I go. I didn't even know what a pro tem judge was. Uh, it turned out I didn't have enough years of experience but it left a bug in my ear. And years later, when I started my own practice after being a public defender and a prosecutor, I started my own practice and I went back to him and he placed me on the bench as a pro tem judge. So that's where the bug came from for me. Um, in becoming now um, a sitting judge, I ran in 2012 for a superior court position and I didn't get it, but I made a really good showing. It's interesting that you mention um, social media because as a marginalized individual, social media is how folks knew about me, knew what I had done and found out about my capabilities. So there are some good and bad as I can see in regards to social media. I share and I try to educate with that platform. And that's how eventually the governor received information about me. I had applied and I was appointed in 2015 and five years later, appointed to the state high court. But I think my presence as well on social media and uh, educating folks on my extrajudicial activities um, was very helpful in them knowing about me as a black woman, I became the state's first black female Supreme Court justice. I also this last November became the state's first elected black elected um, official who ran a campaign. It's never been done. And I was surprised that that's the history. So um, my path was definitely that of an immigrant. I did just about everything, but um, letting them know what I was doing, I think was very helpful as well. So Judge Donald, I'd like to pose that question to you. And, and I'm wondering where your roots were. I mean, so we've just heard from uh, Justice Whitener that hers were in the Caribbean and then she came to the United States. What was, what was your path in addition to that question? Did you know that you were going to become a judge? I had no idea that I would ever become a, a judge. Now, I, I wanted to become a lawyer and I, and, and I went to law school. I'm from Mississippi, so I went across the line to Tennessee to go to law school. And um, once I graduated, my desire was to represent children. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I must say to this day, I've never represented a child, but that's what got me into law school, the desire to represent children. Um, I became uh, a Justice uh, Whitner, a public defender for the county because my boss at Legal Services uh, respected my work ethic and thought I would be really good. And even though I said I would never do criminal law, when he called and, and, and uh, talked to me about it, I felt like um, there was no higher calling than to serve as a public defender. And so I went over and joined him 
uh, as a public defender. And what got me interested in the judiciary was working in the courts and representing uh, people who often are poor and powerless, who otherwise have no voice, uh, a situation where a judge, um, in my mind, denied a, a citizen accused of a crime, her basic dignity and humanity in the process of qualifying her for appointment of counsel. And I, you know, in my own mind, I thought that's, that was inexcusable. And for me, no individual should have to forfeit their dignity to get what the law entitles them to. And that is, if they qualify, representation in a court. And it so offended me that I thought, you know, I can do better than that. And uh, I, at a very young age, decided that I would run for judge. Um, people didn't give me a, um, you know, much of a, a shot at succeeding, but I knew that nobody was going to outwork me. And uh, I worked very hard. Uh, and, you know, when the election was over on August 5th of 1982, they called somebody else the winner. But the next morning, uh, when they finished all, counting all the votes, I was the victor. And uh, I, I knew, though, that I did not want to be a limited jurisdiction criminal court judge for the rest of my life. Um, I was worried about the risk of being in a high volume court, seeing the same people over and over again, that I would lose my ability to objectively accord each person coming before me that presumption of innocence. And I, and I said, I, I said on camera that I hope that if, if I ever felt at risk of seeing people as guilty until proven innocent, I would have the courage to walk away and not stay there because of the trappings of the position. So I, I always thought that I would probably stay um, five or six years. And, uh, you know, I, I, and I did. And I, I will say this, uh, when I went on the bench, my commitment to my community was every person coming in that courtroom will be treated with dignity and respect. And for every position I've held, I've, I've maintained that because I do believe that, you know, in order to, for people to receive justice, they must perceive that justice is possible and they don't lose their humanity when they walk through the courthouse doors because it's not really my court. Yes, I'm the judicial officer, mm -hmm. but every person coming in that court deserves to have an expectation of respect Mm -hmm. of dignity and justice. And so that's what got me started. And that's what continues to propel me uh, in, that, in that position. But I'd never thought in my wildest or any other dream that I might be a judge one day. You all give me chills. You know, one of the things that I find very interesting and, and Judge Hazel, I'm interested in, in your uh, perspective and your journey on this too, is the courage, the courage to put yourselves out there. You know, sort of the presumption, you didn't have presumption that this is what you were going to do. But at each stage along the way, each of you availed yourself to something where other people had to cast a vote. And you didn't know how that vote was going to come out, but you but but you put yourself there. You gave yourself that that opportunity. And I and I do want to unpack that more. Um, but Judge Hazel, how about you? You know, did you come into this space thinking that look, I've got a I've got a straight line. This is going to be my straight line right to that robe, or was it something different? I, I did not come in with that thought process. I think the point that you just made about having the courage to put yourself out there is essential. I never saw myself as a judge. I never saw myself as someone who could be a judge. Someone, the first time I thought about being a judge is when my then boss and still mentor came to me and said, hey, I don't want to lose you. I hope you're not interested, but I've heard that there's this opening and I really think you'd be awesome for it. And, and I didn't even take myself seriously. Um, another mentor then had to come to me and basically have the same conversation with me without even knowing that the first one had already suggested it and say, hey, I was talking to somebody. I mentioned your name. I think you'd be great. I needed somebody to encourage me, to tell me, yeah, you should go for that. And, and that really helped me to think about it uh, and to really say, yeah, I, I can do this. I respect these two people um, who are giving me the encouragement and that infused me with the courage that I needed um, because it wasn't something I had thought of. Now, I will say looking back, 
I can see how things that I did, even though I wasn't planning on it, <laughs> might have prepared me for the bench. Um, you know, I think the one thing uh, that I had in my background that was helpful is, is some, a little bit of professional diversity in the sense that uh, I had a strong civil background and a strong criminal background. Uh, I did five and a half years at Wild Gotcha, which is a large firm. And so from being there, you know, I, I knew how what a summary judgment motion was supposed to look like. I know, I know what happens in a deposition. Um, and so I can sort of speak to those issues from the bench. But then also I spent the bulk of my career after that uh, as a prosecutor, both at, at the federal level and the state side. So I know what the sentencing guidelines look, at, look like and I know how that works. Um, and I had always been someone who thought, you know, I wanna be an advocate. I, I wanna be the ball player, not the referee. Um, but, you know, as, as time went on as a prosecutor, I was really proud of my work as a prosecutor because I believe strongly, I still believe uh, that we need representation in every aspect of the criminal justice system. So, so defenders, prosecutors, judges, um, courtroom clerks, jurors, do your jury duty. It, we, need, we need representation everywhere. And so that included the prosecutor's office. But after I had done it for a while, what I, what I was, the point I was starting to get to um, is one where I really appreciated that the referee is important. Mm -hmm. and, and that, you know, there, are, there was a lot that I could do uh, to what I think uh, was, was try to improve upon the criminal justice system and how things function and, and seeing an African-American prosecutor in the courtroom and what that meant. Um, but at some point, just as my career developed, um, without even me really consciously being aware of it, uh, I started to, to really feel like, or I think get to a place in my career where I realized, you know what, I'm ready to be the referee now. And when uh, I was encouraged to do that, um, you know, I, I, I eventually, after being sort of pushed a little bit, I'll acknowledge, um, said, yeah, you know what, I'm going to go for it. I think that is the next stage. I do think being a referee in the system is pretty important. Uh, and so that's when I really pursued it. One of the things that I'm hearing from each of you is that relationships also triggered part of your journey in this, someone that you knew uh, who maybe spoke to you, tapped you on the shoulder, said, hey, what about this? And I'm wondering with the, the folks in the audience, students, some who are not, uh, because there are many different pathways to becoming uh, a, a judge, I'm wondering what you think is the single most important thing that influenced you. And that doesn't necessarily mean it was another judge, right? Maybe it's somebody from family. Maybe it was a judge, maybe it was a professor, but you know, in your journey, in your life, what was the thing that, or who was the person that most prepared you for where you are today? And I'd like to start with you, Judge Donald. If, you know, if I, I have to just pick a person, I would say, and I, I've said this before, I think law school, uh, a lawyer, but I think my mother really taught me the important principles of becoming a judge because she instilled in me and all of my siblings really uh, this sense of fairness, this sense of self-confidence, this sense of treating people right, that you're no better, you're as good as anybody else, but you're no better than anyone else. And I think that's the, the thing that, that really gave me the foundation on which all of this other um, is placed. Um, and listening to Judge Hazel, and, and I just wanna speak to the students for a moment who are out there. Um, wherever you are now, know that that's a stepping stone to wherever you want to go. And, you are being observed and everything that you do is important. The things that you do today can propel you or they can really restrain you. Um, you are a professional first and foremost. And, and I had this experience in my life. You know, I ran for the first position, but then when I applied for the bankruptcy court, uh, I was a part of a, of a, of a network. Um, it's important to to have those networks, organizations, the National Bar Association, there are people who will get to know you, to work with you, who will be able to speak your name in places that you may not have access to and can help you get to where you're trying to go. Um, on the district court, the fact that I performed the first judicial position well, I ran for it, and in running for that, my name got out there, my congressman got to know who I was, and so when 
an opening came up on the district court, he called me uh, and said, uh, I would like to recommend you for this. And I also want to say to people, uh, know that your mentors and sponsors are not always going to be people who look like you. Mm -hmm. You should not try to do, uh, uh, just get mentors within your, and sponsors within your own race or with, with or, in your, or your gender. But you need to have a broad uh, cross-section of individuals who know your qualifications and who know your character. When a vacancy came up in the, in, on the circuit court, it was an older white male lawyer from Nashville who called me and said, you may not know this, but next year, 13 months from now, there's gonna be a vacancy on the Court of Appeals. And some of us have been talking and we think you would be good for that. Now, I didn't know this person well, I knew who he was, but I had never socialized with him. And that's why I say people are always going to, to um, be watching. You may not even know it, but they're gonna watch your professionalism. They're gonna watch the quality of your writing, your, your oral advocacy, all of those things. And you never know which person is going to be the one to speak up and say, you know, Jane Doe is really a great lawyer. She's got a great reputation. Her integrity is impeccable. And we think uh, she would be good for this. So everything you're doing right now um, is gonna matter in the grand scheme of things and make sure uh, that you do it well. And I will say this, I firmly believe that success is when preparation meets opportunity, your role is to be prepared so that when the opportunity comes, you can step in. So it also sounds like you're saying, you know, the clock starts ticking when you were in law school or maybe yes. even before. So for those who think it begins ticking after, know that you understand that people are watching you where you are and you have yes. the opportunity that you may not even know that you have, depending upon what you're doing. You know, for a future conversation, if we don't get to it, I'm also wondering about how your roots in Mississippi may have affected um, your passion for thinking about helping children, even if that's not the path that you took. So, so I'm curious about that. But Judge Edwards, I didn't hear where you're from, but I would love to hear what influenced you. Is it a person? Um, was it an institution? Um, what has kind of uh, been something that has stayed with you as you are a judge? Uh, I'm a first generation New Yorker. My parents are from the South. I have one grandparent who picked cotton and the other tobacco. So with that said, it was always whatever you do. And my mother would say, I don't care if you picking up a piece of paper, pick it up right and pick it up all right. And my father would not accept anything but the best. So I would say that my morals, my values, and my drive came from home um, to want to make my grandparents proud. You know, they didn't have to pick cotton and no more tobacco as long as I was here. So that sort of like propelled me. And what really kept me going is that I had a lot of different mentors and not necessarily mentors who looked like me. But because I put in my 10,000 hours, it takes 10,000 hours to be an expert in anything they say. And I was willing to work. I was willing to, you can't always step back to receive. Join the ABA, join the National Bar Association, but put your hands in it so that people can see you working. People can know your work and they know your integrity. And when you're at whatever job you're doing now, you do it well. And from that I think that people just gravitated to me and they had faith in the product that I would produce and my word whenever I gave my word, you know. So I have a lot of people who really, really pushed me outside of my family because they saw the push in me as well. You know, people always jump on the bandwagon when the bandwagon is good because it's easy. It's easy to ride. Um, something that's already in motion as opposed to you getting behind that mule and trying to make it go somewhere. So I say, um, as Judge Donald said, I would have to agree, be involved. Um, make sure that you're very diverse in your relationships and be willing to give into work. But sometimes people will step into a space 
well, what do you have for me? And I believe in what our great president said, ask not what you can do for your legal community and your judiciary, what they can do for you, but what you can do for us. And I think that has served you well. Well, and Judge Whitener, thank you so much, Judge Edwards. You, Judge Whitener, you came to this country as a teenager. Um, as you said, you know, there were health concerns that you were able to resolve. Uh, as part of your journey and sort of thinking about what's inside that keeps you going, as part of that being connected back to home, um, what is it for, for, for you? What is it for you? Who connects for you? Well, I am very marginalized. Yes, I'm a black person, I'm a woman, I'm an immigrant. I identify as someone with a disability, my back condition, and I'm also LGBT. My parents were educators, but I'm from a Caribbean island where being LGBT and being disabled will look down upon. Mm -hmm. So I gained strength very early on by those who doubted me. My mother always said, failure is not an option. So anytime I failed at something, get up and stop complaining. That's mommy. <laughs> My father would be one a little calmer who would then explain things. And he always told me to thine own self be true. People will talk about you whether you do or you don't. So do well and keep going. And that has been my philosophy. I, every time someone expects me to fail, I get strength from that. I like when people doubt me because it gives me the impetus to prove them wrong. And I have continuously. Unlike the other panelists, I did not have support mechanisms in place. When I was coming through the legal system, you have to remember this is 20 some odd years ago, the black community wasn't very favorable of the LGBT community. So there wasn't this support network in place for someone like me. But the one thing I always knew is if I performed well, I can always get people to adopt me. And that's how I created mentors. You know, I would do well and have them adopt me. I did not wait for them to approach me, I approached them. And I knew they were looking at my performance. And with that performance, they then of course agreed to mentor. I also mentor because I think it's my responsibility going forward to create those support mechanisms for people like me, whatever facet that is, because like I said, I'm so marginalized, um, but to make sure that they don't have to go through what I did. So I think that's also something um, that we all tend to do as black people. Um, and I think that just comes from our heritage. We are um, community oriented, but a little different with me was the fact that support mechanisms were not necessarily the way folks who are traditionally um, uh, received, mm -hmm. they weren't there for me. So back in those days, balsa was not for the LGBT. So, you know, I created some balsa um, friends who are with me to today, but um, it wasn't always there. I'm really happy of how receptive things are now. Well, I'm glad that you mentioned that, right? Um, the being honest with ourselves and in our communities. And it actually reminds me of when I was in law school, I went to Boston College Law School and, uh, and hosted, I uh, was interested in hosting a fundraiser on HIV and AIDS. And of course my work is at the intersections of constitutional law and health law, what it ended up becoming. But the resistance, it is so interesting that you say that because there was a, a meeting that people had concerned about associating balsa with HIV and AIDS. And one of the things that I felt in my heart and that I knew was that this was something that was so important for us to be a part of. And I was the president of my balsa chapter. And of course, what have we learned since then? You know, um, you know the, the, the medical outcomes, you know, HIV and AIDS became a chief killer amongst black women, uh, 25 to, to, to 34, something like that, uh, and still is a challenge in our community amongst teenagers. So I'm glad that you raised that and the importance of us working through various issues within our own communities. You know, Judge Hazel, I, I'd like to put the question to you, but in a slightly different way. 
you know, one of the things that I'm hearing from a lot of young people these days is this thing about imposter syndrome, which is stunning. And, you know, to me, it's really interesting where, you know, young folks are saying, well, I don't know, should I be here? And, and I just hear my grandparents and whatnot, like, of course you earned your space, you are supposed to be there. And then the narratives that you are all talking about, about be excellent, make sure you get, you know, I sort of think about how you couldn't fall out in a grocery store. There was no such thing as you being able to have a tantrum, you just couldn't, you know? <laughs> so I'm wondering, Judge Hazel, in addition to answering that general question about what has what or who has, has helped to inspire you to this moment, how do you respond to uh, young folks who are in law school or who are in college and questioning whether they should be there? Sure, so a couple points. One, um, in terms of sort of some of the, the early inspirations and, and why I thought I could do it, you know, I, I remember when I was really young, seeing someone, a pastor in my church become uh, a congressman. And that was something that said to me, someone that looks like me can perform at the highest levels of our government. And so that helped me to understand as a young person that yes, I can do that. And so I, I honestly, and you know, I don't wanna be arrogant enough to believe that anybody's looking at me as a role model for anything, but if somebody can look at me and say, if, hey, if, if that guy could be a judge, uh, then I can be a judge someday. Then, then that's one of the greatest honors uh, that anyone could ever bestow upon me. Um, you know, in terms of imposter syndrome, you know, that's that's a term uh, that that I've heard a number of times. And I think what I would say to that person is, you are every bit as smart as everybody else in the room, and and that's something that I wish somebody had really impressed upon me when I was younger. That there might be other people in the room who are more confident than you because they've been told all their lives that they belong in the room. And so they feel more comfortable in the room than you do because people have been telling them all their lives that they belong in their room, where you might have to be the first person to tell yourself, I belong in this room. But, but before, some, before you even have to tell yourself that I'm telling you, if you're in the room, you belong in the room. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've, I've met some people who are very accomplished, who when I was younger in my career, I would have found intimidating. And, and I don't mean this in a negative way. Over time, you start to see they're not smarter than I am. <laughs> they're not smarter than you are. Some of them had more breaks. Some of them had more opportunities. Someone start, some of them started the race a little ahead of me for, for reasons that have nothing to do with my abilities. And so, and so, you know, what I would say to somebody struggling with that, if you have made your way into the room, you belong in the room, you are smart enough, you're just as smart as everyone else in the room, uh, and it's just up to you to go out there and work as hard as you can. And that's the one thing, you know, the whole, the whole concept of imposter syndrome, sometimes it leads to nervousness, you're in your own head. If, if it's at that point, you know, the thing I always found is when I work hard and I'm prepared, my level of nervousness comes down. So even if I do still feel like, even if after I've given myself that pep talk that, oh, maybe I'm not as good enough, well, I can work, I can outwork people. And if nothing else, I can work hard enough to, to keep myself there. So now I'm gonna just open open it up and you know, just turn off your, you know, turn off your mutes, just unmute yourself so we could just have a conversation and we're gonna to get to some Q and A. So you all, each of you has talked about the importance of preparation, do you still think that it is that we're in a space where you still have to be twice as good as if you are, uh, if you're an African American, if you're a black person that you, you've got to bring it because otherwise um, you're just not going to get the opportunities that others would. Uh, Judge Edwards, you're nodding. Yes. Um, I, I just had a conversation um, with some other judicial colleagues. One of them said, um, I write pretty well, and I'm actually in the midst of publishing a book, that you need to teach at the Judicial Institute, right? I said, it doesn't matter. If I teach at the Judicial Institute, the opportunities in terms of with African-American judges still in court assignments, you know, where you sit, the elevations, there's still issues and problems. 
So I said, I can take my time and do something else. She said, but um, you can make a difference. You're very impactful because I actually teach judges and sections on uh, dispositive motions. So, and she convinced me. I said, yes, I'll do it. But um, after a while, but the problem is there's still assignment issues in terms of the high profile assignments and the parts where the African-American judges are given in terms of the administration elevations to the state courts and chief judges, we're nowhere on par. If you look at the uh, Court of Appeals in the last administration, there were no African-American judges who were considered to go to the Court of Appeals. We have Judge Donald there, she's our rock star. So thank you, Judge Donald, just to be here. And I hope that you all have questions for us. She's actually the CLE of the um, Judicial Council. We still have to write, work twice as hard. We have every bar association, every committee to make sure that we stay present and our name is there, but it doesn't mean that the opportunities in terms of growth on the bench, we are still challenged with diversity in color and in women. Yeah. So Michelle, I, what I wanna say, and, and I don't wanna respond exactly to your question, but I do wanna say this. Um, you know, in 2021, it is still unfortunate that we can go and name first here <laughs> and first there. Um, we still know that when we get in these positions, that how we perform is going to impact the opportunity for some other individual. So we are not at a point yet where we are going to be just where we and we alone will be measured by what we do, but other people are going to be either um, they're going to be denied opportunities or their opportunities are going to be limited uh, or enlarged by how we perform in those roles. And, and that carries its own, its own burden. But I think it's, uh, it's uh, incumbent upon us who are here, even if we may have been first, it's important to make sure that we're not last. And we have got to do the work. We've got to perform the test. We've got to go out and mentor. We've got to speak on programs like this. We've got to take people, young people under our wing and help them navigate that. Because it's not really about me. I'm standing on the shoulders of those who came before me. And I need to keep my shoulders strong so somebody else can stand on mine. But I also need to help them see into the distance so they can get to where they want to go. And I need to help them in that process. And so for us as judges, there was a question in the chat about what do we do with our free time? I spent a lot of my time, um, you know, talking to people. I will do take people through mock interviews for, um, you know, judgeships. I am involved in associations because I also think it's important for people to see us. You know, there's a saying that you can't be what you can't see. And we, we are, we, you know, we, our numbers are still limited. So we need to be out there so people can see, yes, it is possible for someone who looks like Rachel to become a judge on the Court of Appeals or a justice on the state Supreme Court or even the US Supreme Court. It is possible, but we have to help make that happen. Well, you know, on that note, Rachel, I'm gonna ask for you to turn to the Q&A to begin queuing up for us. But back with us is also President, President C.K. Hoffler. And I have a question with regard uh, to uh, the National Bar Association, because I think it helps to hopefully root what it means to support those who are in the profession. But also, I think it's important that we level set why the organization exists in the first place. So can you help us with that while Rachel begins to look at the, the queue of questions? Absolutely. Well, um, the National Bar Association was created because in 1925, African-American lawyers could not be a member of the American Bar Association. We couldn't be a member of any bar association. And so it was vitally important, as we know, for Black lawyers to be able to congregate, to get together, to do the equivalent of, it wasn't called maybe CLE back then, but to stand in solidarity nationwide. And so there, the National Bar Association was born. Because one thing that we knew to your question, 
um, Professor Goodwin, was that we had to be not three times, but a hundred times better hmm. than other advocates just to even live and breathe. And so these, the National Bar Association for so many, even if they are members of the, of the American Bar Association or local bars, provides them with the ability to breathe, mm -hmm. to breathe and to live. For those of you who don't understand what I'm saying, it's because you've not been a member of the National Bar Association. Mm -hmm. Because I can assure you that when you confront some of the issues that these magnificent jurists have confronted in their careers, and they've confronted a little something because you can't be successful as a judge and as in, indeed as a professional without going through some tribulations, trials and tribulations, especially if you're African-American and if you're an African-American woman. And so when that happens, you have to be in a place where you can, someone can help you navigate. And a lot of times other bar associations may not help you in that way. They might, but they may not. But the National Bar Association has always been for many of us that place where we can go to, that refuge where we can get help and we can help others. Where there's a pipeline from just as Rachel is a member of NABALSA, this year one of the things that I've done, I've accomplished is going forward every single member of BALSA on any campus, I wanna say in the universe, but in the United States, will <laughs> automatically be a member of the National Bar Association unless they opt out. Why is that important? We have to build the pipeline. When we have a situation right now, like we have a Georgetown University Law Center, my alma mater, where there's a professor that's saying the Blacks are inferior, the Blacks, that's what African-American students were referred to as the Blacks. We know that we have a lot of work to do. So the NBA stepped up for those law students to let them know we have your back and these are the demands that we are we are making on at Georgetown Law School yeah. that we want this administration to do. So that's the reason why these bar associations, the National Bar Association is so important because it doesn't just happen in New York or California, it happens nationally. It happens internationally to black students. That's right. And, and, and let's go to the to the Q&A. Rachel, give us what's what's up in the queue. What have you curated for us? Who's there first? <laughs> Yes, yeah, so um, President Hoffler mentioned this a bit about overcoming fears and challenges. And so one of the questions here is asking for the judges generally and justices generally, what, as you've made transitions in your judicial career, how have you overcome fears and doubts and what, what tools would you recommend to try to push yourself forward in that way? I'd like to take that because I've heard um, Judge Hazel, as well as I just heard the president offer, just say, in regards to we have to be, we know we have to be 100% better. First and foremost, where you are at, you are already better than. You have overcome all sorts of institutional, systemic, and structural barriers to be considered equal and worthy to be where you're at. That means you are better than those that did not have to go through those things. So if you have that frame of mind and you go into any situation, start from that premise, stop doubting yourself. Because if you're a law student, if you're an attorney, and if you're a person of color, you have already overcome and you are already 100% better than. Now don't let that go to your head because you still have work to do and you still have others to bring up with you. It's always about giving back because I believe it was Judge Donald that indicated we're standing on the shoulders of our ancestors. I'd like to say I'm already standing on the shoulders of people like Judge Donald, Judge Edwards. They're still alive. They're not ancestors. But I have the responsibility of moving it forward to make sure you now have a space. So it's reaching out. But I really want to get in students' heads and young lawyers you are already worthy. You have what it takes. That's what got you there. You are better than, because you have overcome many barriers that others have not had to face. It's such I an just, important point. Yes, please, Judge Hazel. No, I was just gonna add one small thing. I agree with everything uh, that Judge Whitener said. And, and I would also add as, as a practical point, don't be scared to ask questions. Mm -hmm. um, don't, don't be scared to find people to learn from. 
that sometimes can help with your fears, with your concerns. Um, you know, finding mentors, I, you know, President Hoffler made, I think, a good point in talking about the MBA in terms of how important it is networks like that can be so that you have people you can ask because you might be somewhere where maybe you don't trust the person working next to you to ask them the question, but you have somebody else in a network like the MBA or BALSA who, who you know has walked a similar path uh, to what you have and you can ask them questions like, hey, I'm seeing this. Can you give me a, a read on, on this situation? Um, it's, it's so important to have people who you can just ask questions of. Uh, and I the think that helps with some of the fears. Professor, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, can I Judge Donald. Can yeah. I say one quick thing uh, on this question? I think one of the things that um, that we have to get comfortable with is this notion, uh, this fear of failure, because sometimes that keeps taking that that step forward, and we have to uh, get comfortable with the notion that some people may reject us, but you know that rejection will make us stronger. It won't kill us. It will make us stronger. Now I had. Uh, an advantage that early on in my life, I suffered major rejection. I mean, I got booed off of a talent stage in junior high school. And when you bottom out in junior high school, you have no place to go but up. Now, I don't recommend that. But I'm telling you, there are lessons in everything. And I want you, I want to tell you now, as you go through this life, your faith will always be important. Your family will always be important. And then your future will be what you design it to be and make sure that you link with others who will help you achieve that, fu that future, people who care about you. Yeah, and, and I like to uh, piggyback. Um, I was going to say James Baldwin, by the next time, you cannot succeed without failure. Mm -hmm. okay? You are going to fall at something, but when you fall, always remember this. If you fall or if someone hits you and you get knocked down because they've rejected you, the first time is on them. But if you stay down and you do not get back up, it's on you. Mm -hmm. You cannot have success unless you fall. It's like riding a bike. You can't learn how to ride it unless you fall off it. So mm -hmm. I would say to everyone because I would not be here today because I've had what some others deal with deem failures, but they were just set back for me to come back and do what I am supposed to do. So don't well, even do that. in terms of level setting, while you curate the next question for us, Rachel, I mean, the reality is, you know, we have folks that are on this call, students who are coming from a stock of people who dared to imagine there was a place called Canada when mm. they were in Mississippi and didn't have Birkenstocks didn't have fancy uh, coats and Nikes or any of that, no train pass, no buses and walked. I mean, let's be clear that there is a kind of mighty power and history that has been within the souls of black people within this country to do the mightiest of things. There are times in which I wonder what was the message that a mother had to figure out to say to her child knowing that the next day that child would be on an auction block and taken away and having to give something to that child that that child could hold on to to survive until we could be at a day like this. There are so many stories that are yet to be written about the strength of black people in this country. Rachel, what's our next question? Mm. Sure. So. Um, I guess for those who are aspiring judges and, and are paying attention to this program today, we'd love to know from you guys what, what you recommend in terms of activities or practical skills that individuals should seek to hone in order to be competitive for um, judiciary positions. I, I like to take that one. Before you think about honing your skills, stay clean. No drinking and driving. This is so important for young people that don't, they don't realize. Even before you graduate, if you have infractions, okay, in your life, it can also stop you from being barred. So make sure that you keep your life healthy and clean. And I would say for the road for judgeship, if you want, you know that's what you want early on, make sure that you can write really well 
and uh, stay very active in your community, especially if it's a position that you have to be elected for because your community will elect you and it matters. Stay very, very close to the legislative branch because they have a lot of power and make decisions. But it's really, really important. You can't do any of that if you have infractions that are behind your name. Pay your credit reports, make sure you pay attention, credit cards, and pay your taxes. There you go. Wow, that is critical. And April uh, and, is coming up. <laughs> yeah. And there was a question um, uh, that asked about what, you know, what kind of courses should I take? What, sh what should I which should be my practice area. You can become a judge from any practice area because you know all of those areas end up in courts. And, and um, so, I, so I think the most important thing is to be excellent in whatever it is, whatever area you've, you've uh, sought to practice in and make sure that you preserve your good reputation. The other thing I, I would say is that I, I know that uh, CK and others are encouraging um, this current administration and probably others to focus on uh, and embrace diversity and, and not just racial and ethnic diversity, but also experiential diversity. So, you know, people who are going on the federal bench shouldn't just come from big law firms or they, you know, there should be public interest people, government lawyers, uh, public defenders, as well as prosecutors. And whether you're talking about the US Attorney's Office or any other position, looking broadly at the profession because we benefit from having diverse views. We all look at things through partially through the lens of experience. And so we need to have those different experiences and those different backgrounds that come to the bench, sit at the table and make decisions about these issues that are confronting courts. So just focus on being excellent in whatever you do and preserving that reputation and doing the things that Judge Edwards talked about. And President Judge, Hoffler, I think... I'd like, if you wouldn't mind just one moment, Judge uh, Hazel, mm -hmm. because I'd like to turn to, um, to CK. So President Hoffler, because I'm sure with part of this question is also what kind of preparation. Yes. What's going on with the National Bar Association that also aids in that preparation? Well, we have a pipeline. First of all, thank you so much, Professor Goodman, for asking that question. We have a pipeline for law students. Um, this year long, we've negotiated multiple year internships or, or partners with different companies, different law firms. We're incorporated in our partnership, the NBA partnership with those law firms or those companies or those corporations is internships for African-American law students. And that's why it was so critical for us to have this ability to access these law students very quickly because if a company says, we've got five positions open in these different states and we need some, we'd like to have them filled with diverse, with African-American law students. We need to be able to access the law students and get resumes right away because, and you know, a day later, some other group of people will take those positions. So the pipeline, the training, the mentoring, the, the exposure to the best and the brightest that this country has to offer, whether it's in judges, whether it's trial lawyers, whether it's you know small um, business owners, you know law for people who are solo practitioners or small firms, big law, everything that you can possibly imagine, we have at the National Bar Association. We have 80 affiliate chapters. We've got sections and divisions. Like for, for instance, the Judicial Council. That's a that's that's a, a, one of the great great aspects of the National Bar and just the training, the CLEs. And if you're a student, it's all free. When would you, I, I, there's never a time when you would have access to such extraordinary talent for free as a student than if you were a member of the National Bar nationally, just getting jobs, networking, all of those things are so important. And I just wanna add something to what Judge Edwards said and what Judge um, Donald said, you know, for young people, social media is so important take down all bad things, risky things. If your grandmother cannot look at you on social media, take it down. This is not the time to show that your body beautiful in a bikini. No, this is not the time to show that you're drinking, you know, a martini, smoking weed. I'm just being real. All that Be stuff real. needs to go, <laughs> needs to go, go, go. You all are going to be officers of the court. Officers of the court. And when I interview young people, interview anyone, 
I'm going to look at their social media. And if I see something that's kind of raggedy or, or indicates to me that there's a judgment issue, because it's a judgment issue if you're posing in a bikini as a lawyer on social media with a martini and weed, that, all of that will come back to bite you. Just take it out because you've chosen a profession that you are a leader, whether you believe it or not, you are going to be a leader in your community. People will look up to you, whether you become a judge or not, but particularly if you want to be a judge. And let's just say, hypothetically, you have a little situation or two that happened in your past. Bad things happen to good people. There are ways of addressing problems, like say you got in a little bit of trouble, or taxes, say you haven't paid your taxes, you can work out arrangements with the IRS, but you must be proactive because when you become a member of the bar, all of that is fair game. Any bar association, is gonna, they're gonna pull your credit reports, they're gonna do all of that. And then it just continues, the stakes get higher and higher. So when you wanna become a member of the bench, all of those things would be vitally important. And with social media, people have access to it right away. So just be mindful of the profession that you're going into. You are the best and the brightest. You're talented. You're wonderful. It's those other little things that can complicate issues. Going back to what Judge Edwards said, what Judge Donald said, I know what Justice Whitner would say, and Judge Hazel, I know, and, and Professor Gooden will tell you, just keep yourself clean. This is what you've chosen to do, so you got to act the part as an officer of the court. Judge and Hazel. I would say, um, oh. Professor Hopper, um, and it's Justice Whitener, Whitener. Oh, I'm sorry. It ties everybody up because it's a black woman with the white name, but anyway. <laughs> um, in regards to social media, um, because of my marketing background, I realize it can be a tool if used effectively. And that is, do, I agree totally. Don't be putting none of that craziness on social media. That is not what it's for. But you can educate people on things that you are doing in your community on social media. You can educate them on good programs. You can educate them on good articles. But be very careful about the things because your reputation is everything. And if you lose that, it's very hard to get it back. So if you're going to use social media, because I know some of you are not going to listen to us in regards to that, but I would say if you're going to use it, be very careful in how you use it, because it can work to your benefit if you use it the right way. Judge Hazel, if you were about to respond, and Rachel, I'll ask you to just queue up <clears throat> what will probably be our final question. I, you know what, what I would love is a weekend retreat. So I'm hoping, <laughs> President CK, I'm hoping that we turn this into something that involves fireplaces, hot chocolate in the morning, and then wonderful dinners in the evening when we can all be post COVID. So I'm hoping that we do that we keep that front of mind. All right. Um, so Rachel, as you look for our last question, um, Judge Hazel, you were going yeah, to- really, I'll just make this point really quick. I, I, all I wanted to do was just say how much I agree with what Judge Donald was saying um, a, a moment ago. You know, I think as, as law students and young lawyers can often, if, they, if they're dreaming about the bench, dreaming about their future, start trying to overthink, you know, what classes should I take? What job should I take? Just find something that you're passionate about and be really, really good at it and, and, and work really, really hard at it and, and let the rest take care of itself. And, and so I just, I think what Judge Donald was saying about that is just so, so important. And while Rachel is getting the question, let me just also say that, uh, because Justice Whitener talked about social media can be used for good. And I'm, I just want to tell people Having gone through uh, the appointments process three times uh, and had to do uh, FB, endure FBI reports, your life is an open book when you apply for the federal judiciary, as Judge Hazel will tell you. Uh, my former colleague used to say, well, they're going to look under your fingernails. So everything you've written, every speech that you've given, every place that you've lived, um, everything is going to be investigated people who uh, that you've tried cases with people who've opposed you on cases and if you are if you are apt to to write and take an extreme position on something if you're going for the federal judiciary you're going to have to defend that position at some point in time and so it's everything is going to come back uh, so i'm not saying don't write and don't think but you just know 
that uh, when you when you write, if you're going for the federal judiciary, you will see it again and you will have to defend it. And look at what's happening with Kristen Clark. Kristen Clark and Vanita Gupta right now. They, I mean, you know, it's political, but right now these two eminently qualified women yes. of color, there is no reason why they should not be confirmed. None in the world. They're going back to 1952. Okay, she wasn't even born. Kristen Clark, when there was a professor that wrote a, a, a book um, that was very racist, that basically said that black people were inferior intellectually to white people. She responded as, I think she was president of the Harvard, maybe Black Student Association or something like that. She responded and gave examples of how that wasn't true. That is being thrown in her face as an example of how she's a racist. And then they have, and then when she invited a professor who they thought was objectionable, it's sort of the Jeremiah Wright thing over and over and over again. Now she's a radical and she's anti-Semitic, all these things that really have been taken completely out of context. So in a political sense, when you go through a confirmation process, all these things by the opposing party will be spun against you. So just remember that. It's, it's because the, 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 the playing field is different. The rules are different for black women. They're just different. And, and we are seeing it in living color right now with the confirmation process with Kristen Clark and Vanita Gupta. What you're pointing to is that double standard um, yes. that exists, um, a very painful double standard. And I'm mindful of, of time. And I thought that we'd be able to get to a last question from the from the Q&A. But I want to pose it. And but but I will say we will take down these questions and we will share them uh, with our guests this evening. So if we didn't get the chance to get to your questions, because I was just loving my opportunity to be with these <laughs> wonderful jurists here, I'm sorry, but we will be in touch with you. But I, but I do want to close with the following question, which is, is there a silver lining? What's the silver lining that you see going forward, given the history that President Hoffler has told us about why the National Bar Association even needed to exist because of segregation, discrimination, and being shut out. Probably painful stories, which you didn't even share today that you've seen on your journey, uh, but that we know does exist, have has existed, continues to exist for so many. But even with all of that, what do you see as a silver lining going forward? And I'm gonna ask each of you, including Rachel to respond. So Rachel, really quickly, silver lining for you, soon to be graduate, Remember the first time she came into my office when I was visiting at UVA? What's the silver lining, Rachel? Unmute yourself. Sure, I can start. Uh, for me, it's I know that there will be more opportunities like this to connect and, and especially with the way things are virtual now, um, at least temporarily, this gives us a really great opportunity to find each other in a broader sense than we ever have before. And I think that is that is something that's important because recognizing that we are not alone in this fight and that there are others who want to work with us and support us is so important in being able to advance the work that everyone's doing individually. Um, I highlighted a few things in the chat. Um, Just the Beginning is a program or organization that helps with pipelines to law school and beyond. And we're posting a program with them tomorrow as the Nabalsa kind of building on this to talk about ways to be more competitive for the judiciary. And, and for me, the silver lining, like I mentioned, is just being able to continue this and knowing that there's so many people who are supporting me and who are, who are on the same journey as me. That's really exciting and rewarding for me. Thank you so much, Rachel. President Hoffler, silver lining. Rachel. The silver yeah. line in the crowd is Rachel and all of the people that she represents. That's the silver that. lining. I love that. Judge Donald. I think the silver lining is the, the knowledge and acknowledgement that we are strong, we are resilient, our numbers are growing. And I think about you know pebbles being thrown in, in the ocean. One, it's not gonna make that much of a difference, but if we just keep throwing, we create this ripple effect and it brings about change. And that's the silver lining. Keep on throwing those pebbles. All right. Oh, I love that so much. Judge Hazel. Mine would be that tomorrow's always better than yesterday. You know, I, I've had opportunities to do things that my grandparents could have never imagined, could have never imagined. 
Um, and, and my kids and grandkids uh, will face less obstacles, fewer obstacles than I did. And we'll be able to continue even to go further. So I, yeah, I, I just, I always believe that tomorrow is better than yesterday. Judge Edwards. Well, I have two. Um, those underserved litigants, underserved litigants come into my courtroom and they look at me and they know they're going to be treated fairly. And I speak to them in their language. Um, that is just so rewarding uh, for me because I make sure that uh, justice is served and, and that they have comfort in justice being served. And the other silver lining for me is being chair of the Judicial Council. I get to reach out to so many young students and young lawyers, Onika Williams, I love her. I'm calling, we're collaborating and working on things together. And I have Catherine Sims, she's over at St. John's University. So this is a blessing for me to be in a position to say, you guys are getting ready to pull the rain and I'm gonna show y'all how to pull the rain because I didn't get that opportunity because I didn't know a judge of color. I didn't know a judge of any color. Uh, when I was coming up. So that's the silver lining for me. And to be here with all of you, it's a blessing. Everyone here is very accomplished. And Rachel, you're going on to big things too. So you make sure that you call us. I am available. Thank you so much, Judge Edwards and Justice Whitener. Well, I think the silver lining is that we've come so far that we're understanding the intersectionality between all of the different codes or marginalizations or stereotypes society has placed upon us. And we are utilizing that and making ourselves stronger. And as my mother always said, as I indicated, failure is not an option, but it's an opportunity to succeed. And we should never stop. We should just keep going forward. I wanna take the opportunity to thank you all to thank those who are part of our viewing audience, and those who are listening, uh, but perhaps not viewing. I wanna thank the American Constitution Society, Justice Whitener, Judge Edwards, Judge Hazel, Judge Donald, Madam President C.K. Hoffler and Rachel. Thank you all for being part of this important, insightful, intimate, conversation. Thank you for giving of yourselves and being so generous and sharing the kinds of stories that otherwise people don't necessarily get to hear about where you came from, what motivates you, what's key in your heart. And for our students who are tuning in, I hope that you leave with the message that you are already enough. You are standing on the shoulders of ancestors who survived, thrived, so that you could be where you are and so that you can do great things in the world. Please tune in and join us for our next program. This closes off the third of four for this 2020-21 year. And we look forward to being in community with you again soon. Thank you, everybody, and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.